Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Strength in the Numbers show. Our guest mentor this week is Richard Reinderhoff and Richard raises a really interesting question around whether or not finance is doing too much and whether or not we need to split what we do between operations in the form of a chief accounting officer and strategy as in a chief value officer and whether or not FP&A is the unsuspecting change agent in this process. So this turned out to be a very fascinating conversation. And Richard also shares his journey from finance operations, where he covered most finance functions, to the importance of planning in a hyperinflationary economy, consulting, his international controllership experiences, as well as those as a CFO, and gives us some straightforward practical advice on how to close the gap between strategy and finance. So look, if you enjoyed this episode, You can always check out our timestamp show notes at www.sitnshow.com slash podcasts. And don't forget to let your friends and your colleagues know about us. We're on all the major platforms, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube. And thanks again for listening in. So without further ado, over to Richard and the show. Richard, uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Now, Richard, you have a very interesting background as a financial strategist, but maybe some of our audience aren't maybe as familiar with your background or that type of work. So would you maybe perhaps mind sharing with us a bit about your journey in finance? Sure. Um, my start was rather odd because I'm Dutch. However, my career starts in Brazil. I started working in finance and accounting and operations, and was, that was mainly due to the fact that Brazil was changing and they needed a lot of planning. Uh, They start to have a stable uh, uh, currency. So the first thing that had to happen is we need to plan before they never had to plan because they had hyperinflation. So I got involved in supply chain management, production planning, treasury financing, uh, working capital management, all those kinds of areas. And of course, uh, uh, being in businesses, uh, you had the risk management, you had the, the high inflation, you had uh, exchange rates, which were fluctuating, you had suppliers, which suddenly got out of business because they didn't plan. So there was a lot of operational uh, experience, uh, hands-on, which I just had to solve because there was nobody else to solve things. And uh, uh, the good thing is in in Brazil, that's a very uh, human uh, approach always. They give you the opportunity and you say, do you want to? Yes. Have you ever done it before? No. But do you think you can do it? I think so. So you just (laughs) have to push yourself in discovering ways to solve things. And um, it's not about, you know, one or two digits behind the comma or it's really about percentages which really hit the balance sheets or the P&L. So you really have to be firm in your 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 position. Um, after that, I changed and entered into the consultancy business, uh, more corporate governance, finance and control. Uh, from there, I got into the risk management and, and business reviews, as into okay, what is having an impact on my company? Um, there were some private equities that were in, also interested in in control statements, so we started to implement in control framework, which is now a very common uh, uh, term used uh, within uh, COSO, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but also, for example, uh, a company which had to, or wanted to expand internationally, but the part of uh, the real estate, they want to have separate from their whole administration. So you talk about sort of business transformation, but also finance and accounting separation and different forms of how do I report uh, all these uh, uh, to management, uh, the advancements, etc. 
And the third stage was actually uh, back to more the controlling bit, uh, more international controlling. You talk about joint ventures as from a holding perspective, which is a whole different dynamics. And also uh, in another company, I worked with a lot of marketing managers, but each marketing manager had an international division behind him. So you work in one company in one country, but you talk to so many different, uh, uh, well, directors that you have different settings and they like to have different reports. And business drivers, which is very key, you need to very well report on that. And each market, each product market, has different business drivers. So that was, that was quite a challenge. And uh, nowadays I'm uh, more into advisory, exactly the bridge between finance and strategy. How can people approach it? How you can set up good reports and how you can interact with uh, different kind of, of publics. You know, like a board reacts different than the marketing manager or product manager. So that's actually my background. Yeah, that, that that's an interesting journey from, I suppose, the, the, the fundamentals of planning, analysis, control, all the way up now to international and strategy. So I'd love to maybe flesh out some of those items that you covered. Um, this is an interesting one for me because I don't think a lot of our audience may have even experienced this, going from a scenario where people aren't used to planning to planning, like that, that initial scenario mentioned in... Brazil, Richard. How do you how do you get people to focus on planning when they've not planned before? Like, is there any sort of things you introduce to make it a bit of an easier journey for them? One of the things I learned very quickly, uh, which actually quite some time ago, was presenting rolling forecasts, not only on mm. revenues but also on costs, on spend. And since they uh, went from a hyperinflation to let's say high inflation, I did a lot of actually cash flow planning which doesn't mean like the cash flow from accounting, but really cash. You know, what is going in and out of the bank? Uh, because in Brazil, you have a lot of taxes and a lot of laws. They change every two, three weeks. And uh, each state has different taxes. Each uh, 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 city has different taxes. So in the end, you need to have really a grips on your wallet. So that. <laughs> And, and they understand that very well because it, it's a country where they are used to survival. Uh, mm -hmm. At one moment, the president uh, took all uh, the savings of everybody out uh, just to save the country a bit. So they are very used to survival. So you talk the language which is cash and money. And from there, you get into the rolling forecast, you get into the, 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 the supply chain management and you get into the production planning. So it was, let's say, gradually that the business there grew into the area of financial planning and, and i sort of got my my, my experience uh, from it and and grew very fast with it yeah actually I, I, you just reminded me of a smaller company i worked with where it was about survival and it's amazing you got to start with the outcome which is really cash cash is king yes, right exactly <laughs> it's the exactly. wallet right and, and you don't care <laughs> about percentages it's really just yeah. oh no exactly but but if you start there um, you, you talk in the language that matters to the people making the decisions. And from there, after you establish a bit of trust, and you can start planning a bit. I love the idea of rolling forecasts. I, I would not have thought, have thought about that. But then you're just building on what's already there. Yeah. And then you can get into the percentages, the value drivers, and build from there. Exactly. So, exactly. Great advice for our audience, Richard. And during your journey, you also mentioned about the international exposure and the fact that you, you, you suggested that we need to uncover the business drivers or the value drivers that way. Um, I suppose any sort of key things we should be looking out for that, that are the key giveaways to identify from those international conversations or interactions, the value drivers? What I used to do, uh, and I did it along several occasions, also uh, once when I turned uh, CFO and company owner, um, talk to marketing, but actually uh, related to where are you going to spend the money? In other words, um, where are you going to... Uh, um, how can I frame this? They have, um, they, they get money. They need to spend <laughs> either or spending it on uh, a market they already know or on mm -hmm. customers who do not know their product. So then you get a, a, a sort of a matrix. On the one hand, you talk about market penetration and the other side, you talk mm -hmm. about market development and they have to make a choice. And through that discussion, you they will tell you what is important to them. They cannot, they cannot bet on both things because then you're stuck in the middle. So you either do one thing or the other thing. 
and you do not have to understand the market, but you need to hear them, you need to listen to them. You have to help them in the process of making sure that their decision is valid. Specifically for corporations, because always every quarter they will ask for cost reductions. So be firm in your strategy and say, I do this in order to obtain something, either a new market, new clients, or you get, let's say, more uh, revenues from the same clients. So you're sort of, in a way, so you're saying it's like validating the return on the yes. spend or the investment. Exactly, but it's targeted on what kind of uh, market strategy. Yeah, I'm very interested in point not to get stuck in the middle. I, I feel um, I feel that that happens a good bit in these conversations. It's like confused. Mm -hmm. So part of the value is actually just having the conversation as to what are you trying to achieve? Yeah. What are the outcomes we're looking at? Yeah. What should we be getting for our money? Yeah. And then... Did you find like any way of maybe, uh, how do you say, uh, tying it back? So checking back or was there any sort of control? Because you mentioned control as well in terms of your career journey. Any opportunity to introduce controls around that? That's what our audience could identify with? Uh, controls, yes. I structured uh, the budget in a different way. I do not use a chart of accounts, but I use projects. So all the spend, they either put in one area, two area, or a strategic part, and each have, let's say, their own chart of accounts. You know, you can hire a consultant for internet marketing, but also a consultant for uh, uh, getting inside the, 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 the area of client or whatever. And, and the other thing is, sometimes there are, let's say, quick wins. Uh, so you talk mm -hmm. about end market development and um, market penetration. Now, if they can identify it, it's sometimes caused by an event. For example, a government changes the regulations, so you can hop in very quickly. So you should always have, let's say, some money left or some in the budget to capture those, let's say, um, yeah, opportunities. I would call them quick wins. Quick wins. Yep. No, no, excellent, excellent advice. And, and the bit I'm really, really, really want to get your, your thoughts on is how do you bridge the gap between finance and strategy? Ah, between <laughs> finance and strategy. Um, avoid telling them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, easier said than done, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Uh, my, the my temptation. Background, uh, my background is strategic management. So, so I know all the frameworks and a lot of marketing managers, they don't. Uh, but that's not important. It's what they talk about. It's what they understand. And you have to simulate uh, their understanding. And just criticize. Be, 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 instead of being the guy who always says no, be the guys who always ask why. You know, that's it. So changing no to why. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why? Exactly. Why do you need more money? Why do you want to reduce the this, this, this spend? Or why, why should something be different? why yeah I, I i i know people might might sort of roll their eyes up at that one but actually try it and see see where it goes it actually could turn into a very interesting conversation you, that you unlocks to, those value drivers to, oh, sorry you will get to the business driver yeah no no fantastic yeah no great bit of advice richard and i suppose that was a, a very interesting uh, career journey but i suppose what's what's exciting you most about your current work well, my current work is more related to advisory. So what do we have today? You have um, finance is, is sort of in a, in, in a changing uh, environment. You talk about big data, artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning. Um, for many years, finance has been trying to fill in a strategic role. Uh, it has always been on the high end of the agenda, number one, two, or three, you know, more strategic development. And then you see how much are you uh, investing in training your personnel on strategic planning, zero or none. So there's <laughs> always been a gap. And, and now I just see there is no option. Uh, you either, as a CFO, try to do everything and get stuck in the middle again, or you start splitting it up. I really see the opportunity in getting finance and the transactions part separated from let's say the business develop part you get the operations uh you talk about controlling compliance but also data they your data has to be perfect who could be better than the it department and an accountant they talk data you talk to the operations they have the kpis now 
a financial CFO, I think he would like to be much more active and needs to be much more active on the strategic uh, side. So you talk about um, I would say business drivers, business models, value-based management. Now that's a whole different ball game. If you split that up in, let's say, a, a chief accountant officer and a chief value officer, they really add value to the board. What has been happening, for example, in the last 10 years? You have IT, it's been booming the last 20 years. So now you have chief information officer. Risk management, since actually 2001, so since the, the, the <laughs> telecom crisis, they have been on the rise. So you have a chief uh, risk officer. Those tasks were under the governance of the CFO. So why not also accounting make that person really in charge of accounting? Imagine what blockchain will do. If you add all that information, it has to be perfect. It, it's, a, it's a ledger controlled system. So we know everything about ledgers. You know, an accountant, they work with a general ledger. So they know everything. With IT, you can become a client for the CFO. And then the CFO is liberated to work on business development. Think about the circular economy. Think about all those small startups. Uh, perhaps you want to have a bolt on to, to uh, explore new areas within your business. So you want to look forward, you want to understand, but you need to have perfect numbers. So why also be responsible for that? And, and I think that's a, a stuck in the middle situation today. The CFO has to choose or um, try to do everything and, and sub-optimize or uh, start evolving. And in this area, I think financial planning and analysis is sort of the trigger and also the, the, the unsuspected, uh, um, let's say, change agent in this process because he's exactly working with the data, trying to get into the story and present it to add value to the business. Now, that's why I'm very much interested in uh, financial planning analysis and I like to help people uh, advance in this career. Yeah, like I, I know you've written about this pre previously, but I suppose is that where the opportunity lies for accounting and finance into the future? Then, in terms to really add value, is is to I to move away from it in terms of towards FP and A, or you know, is there still a role for compliance and controllership? Given that you know you've had that experience in your career as well, is there is there an opportunity for both to coexist or is it in the same organization or is it in effect splitting it up in your mind? What's the best way? Uh, in my mind, I would split it up um, and, and actually upgrade the accounting level uh, like a chief accounting officer. And, and, and I do not want to say downgrade the CFO because most CFOs, they are most of the time involved, especially for large corporations, in merchant acquisitions. You have a corporate business development. That's those are ex financials or people who want to go into private equity later. They talk all the time about valuations. So it's uh, and they uh, investor relations. So the CFO is already in that strategic role. He's already uh, been able to externalize or outsource most of the transaction services. So he should have more time available but don't get stuck into the data. Delegate that to somebody who is really, let's say, who should be compliant and be on top of it. That's my, my, my understanding. And I would say then you, get, then you can get uh, quick wins or you get really advancement. Uh, if you look at the top 50 uh, fortune companies, everything is outsourced. And then, and then we're talking about 10 years ago. So um, HR was outsourced, contracting was outsourced. You talk about uh, accounting in different countries, uh, invoicing in different countries. It was all outsourced. Why? Um, save money. And locally, the controllers there, they had to have a new role. So they started to advance more in financial planning and much more in business partnering. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's, it's a natural evolution of finance which is happening. So I would suggest go on. Yeah, keep 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 evolving, yeah. keep evolving. So, so I suppose let's say, in terms of that keeping keeping that theme of evolving, you know, what things should aspiring financial analysis and planners be looking to be doing so that they're evolving in the right way in your mind? So, I suppose what should they be looking out for? So, over the next say twelve months to remain relevant and be part of that evolution in finance, what things could they be doing now to make sure that they're evolving? 
uh, in terms of towards doing the right financial planning and analysis? If I think about financial planning analysis, my keyword always is forecasting. Uh, it's a central theme. So you have to understand business planning. What is impacting the forecast? So you think about scenario planning, if there is the dollars going up and down, or if with the Brexit, or if there are trade barriers, what will happen to the supply chain? What will happen to your clients? Interest rates might go up, which is actually um, happening already. So what will happen to your clients? Will they purchase in the same amount or not? What will happen to your uh, um, supply credits, etc.? So there's a lot of things happening. So the external elements, be aware of what's happening in the business. So you talk about business planning. So for a financial working in finance planning analysis, don't wait for the information to come from the company, but see what's happening outside and how it would affect the whole business or the segment the, the, the company is working in. Yeah, I, d I definitely agree with you, Richard. I think there's that element of what if it's balancing, you know, making sure there's good quality data to make some what if predictions. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And, and, and you have to talk to management on their ideas. Do they see an urgency or not in your, your assumptions or your subject? Ask what is happening? What are you worried about? You know, uh, do you think about your, 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 your supply chain? Do you think about your IT systems? Perhaps uh, there are some opportunities uh, available. I don't know. Because so much nowadays is being automated and being linked together. Uh, so much open source is available to all kinds of oh, companies. Yeah. So uh, where do you want to develop? Uh, in the old days, the old days, 10 years ago, it was very expensive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <guys. laughs> We, we, still, we still have a bit left in us, Richard. <laughs> the old days, 10 years ago, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I know it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it, exactly. Just us yeah. using this perspective on reality, it's <laughs> absurd. But 10 years ago, it was uh, very expensive to, to change your systems. Now it's open source and you just hire guys to program for you. They all work uh, abroad. That You can buy them by the hour. And, and that's it. Yeah, completely, completely. I, um, yeah, so I just think in terms of the way you've been describing that, it really is, that is the evolution between getting from finance to strategy. Yeah. Is, you know, yeah, no, definitely. And I, so I suppose, you know, that's great advice for our listeners. I suppose in terms of yourself, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received in your career? Oh, uh, in business, expect anything. <laughs> Really, I suppose with an FP&A slant, I suppose yes, <laughs> I can yeah. see why. But 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 maybe for audience, you want to elaborate a bit more. Like why is, why have you found that useful advice for you? Um, well, actually, we have to go back to to uh, a period where um, the company was in trouble, and I suggested to do a turnaround. And I let it turn around, and of course, there were a lot of uh, hurdles, uh, and not everybody agreed. But in the end. We didn't know the CEO came to us and said, would you like to buy the company? And then the second thing he said, you know, in business expect anything. So this is sort of um, things can happen in five minutes. Your whole world can change in five minutes. Uh, so that's, that's a more personal note on why I would say, well, expect anything like that. That's at least one of my, my the, the best advice I received uh, along my career. Actually, there was there was um, funny, funny you should mention that one of my uh, team members he he shared with me a diagram. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like two pictures. One is like the start and end, and it's like a linear pathway to mm -hmm. the goal. Mm -hmm. And then there's other one where it's like ups and downs and yeah. all these different things going on. And I think in that absolutely aptly captures the expect yeah. anything you know because you know, very, very rarely is it a linear progress yeah. towards the goal. There's there's ups and downs and there's sideways, left ways, right ways, different pathways. Yeah. So we really should expect anything, whether it be business or careers. Yeah. Um, it's it's definitely not linear. <laughs> exactly. It's reality. <laughs> it's reality. Yeah. It's just, it's just getting real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I suppose in terms of getting real, any, any resources you found useful and you could maybe recommend our audience check out? Uh, resources. Well, two things. Uh, which had a huge impact on me. Uh, one is actually a very small, simple book. It's called Case in Point. It's a, it's called, it's a complete case interview uh, preparation. If you want to become a strategy consultant, you need to prepare for their interviews. 
So you need to think strategically, you need to get into the head of the board or CEO and think what would we decide? What, are, what is important, you know, like mergers or, or outsourcing or turnarounds or anything. So that kind of thinking, um, you have to learn. You don't learn at that school. Uh, even if you study business administration, you do not get it. They have specialized courses on oh. case studies. So case in point is really a practice book. You can practice with other people to get it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there are like uh, guesstimates in it, like how many uh, golf balls go into an airplane. And then you have to start <laughs> thinking, really thinking, <laughs> projecting uh, what it will be. And I used that exercise a lot uh, when I was uh, teaching uh, at an MBA. Every uh, lesson I gave them assignment as in uh, how many cars or trucks will be sold in 2014 in the United States. So then you have to figure out how many people are there, living there, how many families, how many people have a rural life, things like that. And then you start to really get into the analysis and it's into how much would my market size be. And that's just a mind practice. Now, if finance can do that, specifically financial planning analysis, then they can sit with the director, but also with the product manager who is saying, okay, my market will grow 50%. Yeah, right. Give me some numbers. So you start asking, where are they? How many are they? How often? How quick will they start buying? And so you get the whole logic as into an analyzing, an, uh, analyzing a plan or an idea. And I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, no, I, I completely. And, I, you know, people are thinking, well, what's the point in knowing, like, how many trucks or how many golf balls could probably fit in a plane? Well, it's not necessarily the outcome, although it is interesting. It's more the thought process. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the other thing which I found extremely helpful, which really also changed a part of my, 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 my not my career, but my, my perception towards uh, management, that was a documentary called The Corporation. It's, I think, from hmm. 2005, six or two. It's free on, on, on YouTube. I think it's two and a half hours. I bought even a DVD with extended um, coverage of the interviews. It is the best ever. Why do I think it's important? It explains why corporations exist and why management behaves in a certain way. Now, if you think about forecasting, mm -hmm. All the numbers that appear are the result of a decision. They are, uh, the, 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 somebody makes a decision and then action happens and then it appears in the books. So your financial numbers are like say the reality after the fact. So if you want to understand the fact, you have to understand management. And they think differently. They sometimes do not have the same moral as you have. Uh, markets react differently. Uh, many more things happen behind the scenes than you think or than you expect. It's a different world. So that documentary opened my eyes. It also has a, a block or a part related to sustainability, how it got started and why it's so important and why certain uh, CEOs really um, picked it up and made it something real, becoming an international business case or an example. So that's a really, really good um, understanding the, the documentary of businesses and governments and how they all interact and why management and people behave in for us sometimes weird ways. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's um, I really appreciate those recommendations. I, I'm not familiar with either of them, so I'll be checking those out. And I suppose, Richard, you know, if our audience want to continue the conversation, where's the best place to connect with you at? Um, well, first through LinkedIn. Um, I get invitations uh, to have small talks on, on, on issues they have, like, uh, for example, uh, what do you think about near future because the market's getting turbulent or there are things happening. I always give comments on, on specific areas, like, for example, interest rates are rising. So what do you want to know from your management? What do you need to prepare for? Uh, since I have experience with high inflation and, and high interest rates, very high interest rates, uh, mm -hmm. I have a different approach, very pragmatic, you know, get out of the accounting and get into the cash management, you know, cash is king again. Uh, although there was an abundance, it has been providing a lot of, uh, giving us a lot of problems nowadays because we are too indebted. Many companies are too indebted and the valuations will uh, spiral downwards as soon as interest rates goes up. 
So um, just calculate the wage average cost of capital. It will go up. So <laughs> there goes your value added. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's um, it's one of those inevitable things. That's the nature of cyclical economies, business. What goes up sometimes has to come down. Indeed, indeed, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so look, Richard, really appreciate your advice and you should being so sharing with our audience. Any parting thoughts uh, before we finish the, the podcast together? Um, well, I, I think uh, the opportunities for financials are uh, really, if you're in accounting, look at controlling, data integrity, but also impairment. You know, there are a lot of small business mm. now coming right. and you have merge and acquisition of small companies. Uh, if you're a financial, get into the value creation. You know, you have McKinsey approach, you have Oswald Demer Darren, you have his philosophy and his books are wonderful to read. You learn so much about the business, just trying to, not, not even making a valuation model, but understanding what is so important. And I think executives who want to advance more in, in to the board or a non-executive uh, uh, director, uh, get experience, uh, practice coaching, uh, think about strategy. It's all about the future now. And the future is happening very fast. So that would be uh, my closing thoughts to, to uh, the audience. Uh, as for myself, uh, in general, I, I like to get involved with restructuring, business process transformation, uh, of course, financial planning and analysis, you have the whole risk management where there today, I think the risk appetite and the management culture are becoming very important to make that visible uh, because managers make decisions and they impact your financial planning. Uh, they impact the risk of the whole corporation sometimes. So I like those are things which are interest me a lot. Uh, uh, help small businesses or private equities with portfolio companies, you know, the, the integration. It, it, it's all about people and helping them understand what finance wants from them. But in normal terms, that's wonderful to do. Yeah, I, I think definitely two key things really resonate with me there in those parting thoughts, which is a value creation and it's all about people. Yeah, correct. Fully agree. That's it. Exactly. That's the essence, really. Yeah. So no, no, I, I love, but I love that. And again, I, I know I extracted the essence there, but it was really there's a lot of areas that you suggested that we can go and do that. So fantastic advice and fantastic way to end our conversation. So Richard, thank you for investing your time with us today and coming on the show. Well, thank you very much. And uh, who knows, uh, we might talk again. Thank you. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.